Alright, and hey guys, I'm back. Zero option here again. So, new uh, new intro, new format, and a little bit of a new direction, at least for a little bit here. So, I know I said I was going to start my first uh, sci-fi political exploration video with uh, The Road to Damascus by John Ringo and Linda Evans. Unfortunately, my laptop tanked while I was in Muskoka. My secondary hard drive completely wiped, and my video card crashed. So... Starting over with a bit of a new system, I put together a quick little cheap tower and uh, put a decent video card in it so I can actually stream a lot better now. So there should be uh, some live streams now, hopefully more often. Let's hope that pans out. Also a new microphone, hopefully you've noticed the sound quality should improve just a little bit. So, this is going to be an exploration of the politics of the Expanse universe. This one is going to be a basic overview and each faction is going to get their own video. So the first faction we're going to look at is the UN, and then we're going to look at the MCRN, the uh, Mars Congressional Republic, and then the Outer Planets Alliance, or OPA. So, a brief overview of The Expanse. It is a small screen adaptation, and a fantastic one at that, of uh, the books, uh, the Leviathan Wake series by J.A. Comey. Now, fantastic books, cannot recommend them enough, especially if you're into sci-fi, political intrigue, and uh, plots so convoluted that you can barely wrap your head around it, but treats you with enough respect that knows that you've got enough intelligence to keep up with the plot, so there's not a con lot of constant exposition and in-depth explanations of certain things, which is nice. So the first one we've got up here is the UN. Now, the UN in this universe uh, governs over Earth and Luna. It's the moon. So, now... There is 30 billion people living on Earth at this point. There is, I believe, uh, 2 billion plus living on Luna. And the UN is basically a stagnant autocracy. Everything we could have possibly feared about the UN and its ineptitude is brought to absolute life in this depiction of the UN in this series. They are overly corrupt, concerned about image. Um, the vast bulk of the population lives on what's called basic, which basically means the government provides you with food and housing and clothing and literally nothing else. So you see a lot of communal uh, places and uh, people tend to, especially the poorest people, tend to die a lot there. Climate change has basically racked the Earth. It's uh, made quite apparent in the intro. And if I scroll ahead here one photo, you'll see here that the Statue of Liberty is actually surrounded by a wall, and most coasts are now surrounded by a 50-foot wall in places to keep the seawater back. The ocean is still polluted, highly acidic, and it's described as a brown, terrible waste by the Martians, who live on Mars, obviously. So. You can see that it's rather futuristic looking. The series takes place approximately in the year 2500, give or take. Um, I can't remember the exact dates. We'll get them later. But um, relatively futuristic looking, but not so like um, outlandish as, say, Star Wars or Star Trek. The series is grounded a lot more in reality. Humanity hasn't spread past the solar system at this point. They're still reliant on... Uh, thrust gravity for their ships. Their ships are actually like giant skyscrapers in terms of their orientation in space. So as you would see a normal ship in space, which I'll bring up later, the orientation is actually flipped on its side. So if you were to cut away the ship, you'd actually see people like almost laying down and the floors going up and down across the hulls. But we'll explain that in a later picture. Now this is a picture of uh, the United Nations flag. Uh, this is the governing body of Earth and Luna. They also, um, in the asteroid belt, have uh, per protectorate control of the space station Ceres, which is a giant dwarf planet. Well, giant is uh, a relative term for dwarf planet. It's one of the largest of them at 900 kilometers across. And they've spun it up to induce a rotational gravity but the UN currently controls the space in and around Ceres and administers it. That is their farthest flung, flung colony at this time, I guess you would call it. The other flag over here is the Mars Congressional Republic, a 
basically a militarized autocracy. They claim to be a congressional republic, voting members, but it is a highly militarist, highly militarist society. You'd think I could speak today, but apparently not. So, highly stratified society, military service is mandatory, and almost um, extreme nationalism. Nationalism, the absolute extreme. Martian exceptionalism, everyone for the cause, their entire ethos as a society is an entire generation united by terraforming the planet. And their plan is to terraform Mars in, within two generations, which throughout the show you can actually see them accomplishing to a considerable extent. There are several billion people living on Mars at this point, I believe six to nine billion living on Mars during the course of this series. They're also a heavy, heavy hitter in the system. Um, if you had to make a, a absolute reductionist comparison, you would have the United Nations as it stands now versus what would essentially be America if it had gone to its extremes as a militarist society. Here's another picture of the skyline of New York City where the UN headquarters is located right here. This is fleet headquarters. You can again see the walls, the generalized decay of things. And you see all these shiny buildings, but what you see a lot more in the series is the actual people who live there. And there's a lot of protests and a lot going on. But again, this is an overview video and all the additional factions will get their own deep lore videos and explorations, how they work together and so forth. The next is the MCRN, or Mars Congressional Republic. The N just stands for Navy. Everyone just refers to them as dusters or Martians. Dusters is the pejorative term. Martian is the technical term, how they identify themselves. Uh, having lived on Mars for so long, they've actually physically adapted to the environment. Their bodies are pretty much only rated for one-third G as Mars produces, and it's evident in their society. Their society is also highly advanced. It is the most advanced colony in the system, and they are extraordinarily proud of it. It is a highly militarist society. Whereas the UN fields mass numbers of lower quality ships and troops, the Mars Congressional Republic prefers to field smaller numbers of the most advanced and powerful ships and small units of advanced powerful soldiers. And in their own lore video you get to see pictures of them as well. I won't be doing actual videos of them because my entire Expanse review library was yeeted by YouTube as it was copyright claimed and my channel is almost taken down because of it. But that's a story for another time. Now. Mars, I said, was a highly military society, which is true. All members of Mars serve. And it, their society is very much similar to the way of the United States in the 1950s and 60s. Um, a lot of exceptionalism, drilling constantly between the constant Cold War between Earth and Mars, which comes to a head in Season 2, and hopefully to a head again in several other seasons ahead if they follow the books. But Mars is, by definition, a congressional republic. All members are voted for, but generally no one can serve in the pol political class unless they've served militarily to some degree. Most of the high-ranking members of the Martian Republic are ex-servicemen themselves or still serving servicemen and women. And um, other than that, that is the Martians. And this is what their, some of their ships look like. This is the Donager. This is their flagship. Now, you'll notice that it's very square and blocky. Um, they've got the rail guns on the side. Their point defense cannons actually protrude out of the ship from recessed ports. This is their torpedo tubes. And if you were to orient the ship how it actually would, the crew would stand on, you would have to flip this 90 degrees in this direction and it would be almost like a skyscraper in space. But because there's no actual orientation or horizon in space, except the artificial ones you define yourself, all the ships are like skyscrapers and they all operate under thrust gravity, usually between one third to one G. And in cases of uh, combat and uh, high hot pursuit, upwards of six Gs. 
Now, they have MacGuffins and all that stuff that uh, explain this, but we're not going to go into that because this is a political adaptation video and not a technical and deep lore dive. That might come again if I decide to revive my review series. This is the hero ship, the Tachi. It's repainted in the series, obviously, as a dull gray called the Rosinante, led by the main characters James Holden and his crew. Essentially a warship for hire. They find themselves in all the crazy ongoings throughout the series. And they're generally your titular characters. You can also see on these ships that there's no windows. Everything is done by screens and cameras inside these ships. And again, if you were to flip this ship up on its side, with the actual proper orientation for the crew. But uh, yeah, they went took the above and beyond step to like make sure that these ships were very much grounded in reality. Which, as a science fiction nerd, I can appreciate. The final group, the Outer Planets Alliance, or the OPA. These guys are your ANCAPs, your anarchist communist types. Uh, no real actual governing coalition per se until much, much later in the series. Until then, it's a loose coalition of tribes, often referred to as Belters or Beltaloda. Now, they have their own unique language and symbols because their society is adapted to live in space. So they're either on space stations or in ships or in their spacesuits almost all of the time. So a lot of their uh, language is gestural, guttural, and uh, very phonetic. Um, because of poor communications and whatnot, they would have to use hand signals. And again, more to explain that in the political deep dive videos. But it goes a long way into exploring how their um, society evolves. These guys can't even survive on Earth. Their bodies have adapted to zero to from zero G and microgravity to less than one third to one third G. Now, because of that, they can't set foot on Earth anymore, and it's often used as torture when the UN takes OPA terrorists into Earth for interrogation. It's called gravity torture and technically illegal. But more on that in further videos. These guys are anarchists, no uh, governing actual body. Um, the closest thing you can come to two main leaders would be uh, Anderson Dawes, who leads the one faction at a series, and uh, Fred Johnson, who and Kamina. Um, oh, I can't remember her. Kamina Harper, Harker, who um, leads the. Uh, other fa major faction out of the Tycho Station, which is the other major uh, Outer Planets Alliance outpost, which is the biggest station in the system and routinely spins up asteroids and in the first season is building the Mormon ship um, to go to the Alpha Centauri system, a generational ship. And yes, the Mormons still exist in uh, this universe, and it seems to be one of the very few times that religion's actually mentioned is only when the Mormons are brought up. But they're a very, very minor character in the grand scheme of things. They're only there to really facilitate the uh, introduction of the uh, behemoth, which is the future OPA flagship, which there'll be pictures of later, because it's a church built in space that they slapped a bunch of guns onto. So they are often considered terrorists by the MCRN and the UNN and are routinely either uh, hunted down, marginalized, oppressed, and basically downtrodden upon. They're seen as subhuman because of their weak stature, um, their lack of uh, common, null or common language, uh, lack of governing body, the fact they live a nomadic life. But they are a fiercely inventive people uh, fiercely loyal people, family connections mean everything, and um, when I said anarcho-communist, uh, the communist is because their main um, slogan is, the more you share, the more your bowl is plentiful, and uh, the biggest insults are well walla, uh, which basically means you hoard water or traitor to your kind, because scarces are so resource, or Resources are so scarce in the belt and in outer space that the belters have developed almost a minimalist communist society to cope with it. And while it's not an actual full-on communist society, it is very communal living. Um, I would almost call it Marxism light with uh, the occasional hint of um, Middle Eastern terrorism. Not religious-based, but... 
And so, because the power went out and I got cut off mid-sentence, uh, Marxism light and a little hint of Middle Eastern terrorism, not exactly ideological, but more based on the premise of wanting to be left alone to their own devices, um, or their own homeland. Again, it's an issue we can explore in the OPA video, but as it stands right now, um, I hope uh, this overview will give you a generalized understanding of the next three videos to come for the exploration of the Expanse series, and while that's going on, I'll still continue to work and put together the long-form video for the Road to Damascus, which dealt with uh, the populism mixed with socialism that can destroy planets and uh, populations and cultures. Such as, uh, <laughs> but that wouldn't happen now, would it? Not at all. <laughs> so, um, guys, it's been good having you again, and um, so uh, I've had to finish this video off with just a little bit about uh, what's happened the last little while. Uh, so yes, I am going through a separation at the moment. Um, it's hard, it hurts, but um, we've both decided as adults that we need to work on ourselves and then we'll go from there. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time this next year uh, healing myself and uh, coming to terms with a lot of the stuff I've dealt with over my life and things I've gone through and um, hopefully uh, moving forward and learning to be a much better person because of it. In the meantime, I'm also going to be posting some videos for a new side project that I've got going on where um, I'm going to be doing some 3D printing of amputee uh, prosthetics for animals. Um, I'm sure some of you are aware about the uh, dog trade that goes on in Asia where they're treated as livestock and food as opposed to the loving pets that uh, they deserve to be. And they're brutalized essentially, have their legs amputated while they're hung on hooks and it's just, it's all sorts of nastiness. And uh, well, my mother actually res rescues them and uh, helps bring them over to Canada so they can go to forever homes. And a lot of them are coming over as amputees. So to sort of, maybe give myself a peace of mind and help make some other creatures that didn't deserve to suffer whole. I'm going to be uh, doing some prosthetics, so I hope you'll join me for some of those videos, and um, we'll see some progress on that. All right, so hopefully we'll actually have some prototype videos at the end of this weekend to show you guys, which would be awesome. So with that, guys, I hope you have a great night. Um, like and subscribe, share the video. Um, YouTube, uh, we've all seen what's happened to YouTube in the last couple of months and it hasn't been good for any of us. So, with that, um, just love each other guys and love yourselves. Hear that thunder? Nuts, eh? It's been going on every night. So, let's have guys.